All right, just testing this mic. Sounds pretty good. All right, final AgriLinks event of 2016. Uh, today we'll be discussing early generation seed systems, which is a topic of rising importance in the ag development context. And we also have a potentially very large number of attendees joining us by webinar from around the world. So that's always exciting to have our online audience as well. Uh, the AgriLinks platform is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. So I'd just like to shout out to the KDAD project and thank them for their support on this event today. Before we get started, uh, just a few reminders and housekeeping issues. Uh, for those of you in person, we just ask of you silence your cell phones so as not to interrupt the speakers. Uh, we will be starting off with the, the block of presentations today, so we'll let each of our presenters uh, uh, start off the event today, and then at the end we'll be having a Q&A period. Uh, we typically have a mic that we've passed around in the past uh, for the in-person audience, but we uh, weren't able to get that microphone set up today, so we'll just ask that you uh, speak your question loudly from your place, and we'll uh, very quickly summarize your question up here so that the webinar participants can hear what you asked. Uh, this webinar or this event is being recorded, and uh, if you signed up or registered or provided your email in any way, you will get an email with the recording and any other associated post-event resources uh, that you can share with your colleagues or review uh, the event and review the information. All right, so with that, to give us an introduction to the content and the speakers, I would like to introduce Mark Heisinger, who is the BFS lead on Early Generation Seed. Uh, along with David Atwood, and he's in the Market and Partnership Innovations Office at the Bureau for Food Security, and the Senior Program Manager for Scaling Seeds and Technology Partnership with AGRA. So Mark will uh, introduce our panel today. All right, well, thank you very much. It's a great showing and uh, glad to have so many people online as well. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time, uh, even though an hour and a half is set out for this uh, session, uh, we have a lot of material. So it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, presenters. Uh, first of all, to the far left, uh, Walter DeBuff is a senior program manager with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's been uh, our partner specifically uh, on this, the early generation seed work for the last two and a half years now. So this is... Uh, quite a lot of uh, deep engagement with Walter. Uh, he was also coordinating specifically with the Ethiopia, Uganda, and Burkina Faso work on uh, behalf of, of the foundation. Uh, next to Walter is, is Mark Nelson. He's a uh, partner at Context Network and is uh, here under the Africa LEAD con uh, cooperative agreement that we have with DAI. Uh, and I also want to make a special listening on, on a webinar. Uh, he's been uh, very closely involved with us uh, as the Africa lead point person. And then Latha Nagarajan of the International Fertilizer Development Center and uh, also working with Carl Prey at Rutgers, who I want to call out as well, uh, on the... Um, working on the Scaling Seeds Technology Partnership uh, Cooperative Agreement and is uh, responsible for Tanzania, Mozambique, Malawi, and Ghana. I should have mentioned that Context Network did uh, Nigeria, Kenya, yeah, Rwanda. Zambia, Rwanda. Yes. So uh, this is now the end of the second what I'd say the second phase of the early generation seed work that we've been doing. In most of these countries, we're now moving to an implementation phase where we, I think we've got a, a momentum in quite a number of countries and we're really hoping to see that the problems and opportunities you're going to hear about in the next uh, hour and a half really start to get some, uh, start to be addressed at the country level and that we start to see some mm -hmm. 
there is the seed cycle. We see an emergence of capacity in production and marketing of quality seed of improved varieties. That kind of progress, if you look 10, 15 years backwards and where we stand now, there is really more capacity in more commercial production and marketing of quality seed of improved varieties. At the same time, through the work where USAID and also the foundation and many other donors are working together, we engage really in building the capacity in plant breeding, public brand breeding, some cases also more private, uh, but primarily public brand breeding through partnerships with the CGIR institutes, but also focusing on ours to really increase the number of domestic releases of improved varieties. If you look at countries, really a big increase has taken place. But these both increases did not result in use across all uh, uh, food crops. We have seen increased in use in quality seed for hybrid maize, but many of the other crops that is really lacking behind. And in that way, our aim to increase food security, to boost productivity, and that way, pull smallholders out of poverty and contribute nowadays what we call egg transformation, we are still lagging behind. Despite our investments, a lot of work needs to be done. So we started to look, and many fora have been organized, and uh, David Atwood called many of them. Many times we have been sitting around the table at national level, at regional level, at continental level, anywhere in the world, always calling out what are problems, counterfeiting, quality assurance, foundation seed, intellectual property, food aids in influence uh, on all these other issues. So many, as you can see in this slide. So that we always called out many meetings. Every time we prioritize, every country sets up the priority list. And basically, we are paralyzed by analysis. No next steps. Also, because many of these issues are not in independent, they are all related often with an emergent seed sector, small companies, but not mature enough, political economy, dealing with seed, it is a commodity, uh, 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 government systems which are still moving ahead, uh, public structures which are vulnerable. It's not easy. We said we have to go beyond that. And I think that was really when we started to have the conversations, uh, 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 when I joined in the foundation in 2013, and very soon talking with Mark and David and others in the agency, we have to pull one point out. And basically, we chose really early generation because often it was one of the top list, but also it basically reflected on the major investments that the, the agency and the foundation make in crop improvement. And basically, if we really want to have a structural adoption of new, every time new, regular adoption of improved varieties, we need to, to tackle this one first. And not putting all the other topics away, but focus. So we started, and that's basically also where we as the foundation came in, and then also the, uh, the agency uh, was very clear. Let's try to build a strategy, try to build some evidence what is the situation in early generation seed? We are often involved, we both organizations, but many others, indirect interventions. Let's keep doing that, but let's put also a hold on that and see what needs to be done first. And try to seek, instead of temporary solutions, systemic solutions to this problem. And also systemic, try to come with a solution that will last because often we are engaged in the production and distribution of uh, uh, S donors in, in early generation seed production and marketing. But by doing that, mm -hmm. we basically also hamper structural solutions to come. So what we also realized that if you look at the previous slide with all these issues, all these issues need to be solved more at national level. That's where sovereignty over seed issues is a game. Of course, regional economic communities can help and also support some of the aspects, but a key element 
policies and regulations are made at national level. So that's also where we started to focus on. And we sort of try as committed development partners to play a catalytic role and start to be not afraid to make dirty hands in this kind of systemic uh, uh, institutional process. At the same time, building all those experiences also and the better insights that we say, we started to embed to take what we call uh, a pluralistic approach to seed sector development, allowing us to say, okay, we acknowledge that there is a formal and informal seed system. And also we acknowledge that both public and private sector are playing key roles in the seed sector. So here in this slide, you see a journey. Uh, I see the letters are a little bit small, but uh, uh, that we made over uh, last years. We started to engage first uh, as Gate Foundation and uh, agency through Africa Lead in a study commissioned and was implemented by Monitor Deloitte, which really set out a basis of looking differently at this problem. We didn't only uh, 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 study it, but we also started to really vet it among development agencies, private sector, to see if this was, that was done in a convening in March in 2015. Uh, and then we said, OK, we need to bring it down to the national level. Then the Agricultural Transformation Agency in Ethiopia took at the guts to directly apply this and try to implement translate this work by Monitor Deloitte into a methodology to, uh, 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 to further elaborate what is the situation in the country and what could be done. Build some more economic analysis and, and move beyond the original system. Gradually also, USA through Africa lead start to bring context on board to develop a methodology that could be easily translated to many other countries and also uh, uh, could be further developed. So then we brought, and we and through the missions, and I, I really want to acknowledge USAID's missions in this place, uh, they really uh, also stack out their neck, uh, as we say in Netherlands, uh, and they really start to engage in this work. So we got, in, we got involved in another 10 countries in this similar type of studies, and several countries also, seed stakeholders, acknowledge the importance of this issue brought it into an existing platforms or uh, through other mechanisms start to really develop, discuss this issue with this particular methodology, fine tuned by context into, uh, 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 into the seed platforms to see how they could tackle, how they could build a, uh, evidence for tackling this issue. We brought all people from these 11 countries, key players in the sector like AGRA, CDIR institutions, into a convening in Addis Ababa, where we discussed in general and also tried to build this consensus, uh, not consensus, tried to get better insights what needed to be done. And then 10 other countries, seats, uh, platforms, national consultants, uh, 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 consultants uh, contracted by uh, uh, first uh, the, the seat uh, and uh, scaling seat and technology uh, partnerships through AGRA and also through uh, uh, Africa Leads, they got engaged in those country studies. So at the moment, we are concluding a phase where we synthesize these outcomes of the convenings. We synthesize the outcomes of these 11 country studies. This today, I think, is a kind of turning point moving towards <laughs> next steps, which I will put some ideas from our side on also in the end. Just to show you the diversity of countries uh, that uh, these studies were done. You can see that in the slide, they cover quite pretty well the continent. It's also very interesting that in every country, a prioritization was done uh, uh, on the type of crops they wanted to do. And we emphasize always to look for different types of crops. So in nine countries, maize was done. A study was done. Other countries also, uh, 13 cereals were covered, especially rice. You can imagine, especially in West Africa, uh, a very important crop, but also in Eastern Africa. Very important, legumes. 90 times leguminous crops were studied, showing that in all the countries, stakeholders saw that there is a big problem in uh, EGS for uh, legumes. Seven times seven, and of course, uh, some places, cow soybean, cowpea, West Africa, and groundnut in several places. 
then also in six countries, Tanzania and basically West Africa, uh, you see that the importance of cassava and yam, and in Eastern Africa, potato also issues. And in two countries, sesame was included. Just to recognize who were implementing those studies, so uh, the, the SSDP pro, uh, partnership uh, under AGRA was involved in five countries. Africa lead with its contractor a context in four countries. Uh, uh, a West African Agricultural Productivity Program through CORAF in Burkina Faso, and a Dutch funded ISD program in Uganda, and ATA teamed up with the others in Ethiopia. So what was really so critical in doing this work is that based on the work of Monitor Deloitte, then confirmed in that convening and then further elaborated by context, we really started to look at the crops, food crops that we are concerned about through an angle of where steps in what you see in these rows, in, this thick, uh, in these columns here, where, which steps of the seed value chain are profitable. And we realize that in only few cases, that is the only where a profitable means, uh, a blue, dark blue means uh, private sector, primarily, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so if you really look at the, the left column is dark blue, meaning all steps, except perhaps the, the, the first one, all steps in the seed value chain from breeder seed, foundation seed onwards are basically profitable or the margins for commercial seed are so high that they can cover all costs. Basically, hybrid maize. But for the other food crops, most other food crops, the other configurations of the seed value chain are relevant, where green means public investment. Sometimes public investment implemented by private operators. So you see that there are different kinds of partnerships required in these two, the second and the third, to make this seed value chain moving. Nothing new we knew, because if you look in the country where we are now, a lot of crops, public involvement in breeding, and also interesting public-private partnerships exist in the production of sweet potato, seed, ground nuts, wheat. But basically what is important to realize, since London we accepted that there is a mixed model required for dealing this food cross forward. The fourth column you see in niche markets, and I often use basically cotton. So, but there are other commodities, crops, uh, uh, that would fit, for example, being Dutch malting barley might be one where, for example, Heineke is involved in Ethiopia in getting some new varieties on the market that support brewers. So that is the fourth modality. So this is very critical to start to have this look. And basically, in all the country studies, people went deeper, and both Mark and Lata will show you more details on specific countries how this works further. So we start on the base of economic analysis and looking at seed systems, we start to distinguish the different seed value chains. We start to restructure, uh, find the evidence how to restructure uh, EGS uh, systems in countries. We saw really, and we see that public-private partnerships are critical to move forward, but there's no single public-private partner. There's many different ways to organize that. We saw the role of public expenditure, and also basically commitments of national governments to invest perhaps in not in quality seed, but more in early generation seed. But also knowing that for breeding, the CGIR plays a very important role. So, and they are also involved sometimes in moving forward. So we have to review that. Our focus always has been catalytic. But at the same time, we realize and every time if you see national reports, EGS is just one of the problems. Many of the other issues on quality assurance, IP, varieties coming forward. So need, but what is critical to see that through this process, we, by focusing on evidence, economic analysis, and not to be afraid of diversity in systems, we made some steps forward. Looking through the next steps, 
very quickly, I will share some of my views and I'm sure later on we'll go through. We, we see three levels of restructuring EGS systems. And I will say very high level. Some countries where you have a strong commitment of the government, private sector, you have a leading catalytic organization that can, has the power to engage with key stakeholders in a, a basically a restructuring or transforming uh, action. You could, in four or five years, restructure how the responsibilities are divided and how financial and technical uh, uh, responsibilities are thrown through a country. For example, in Ethiopia, there is a plan how to move forward. Other countries like Tanzania, there is really starting to become a consensus among key stakeholders that they need to tackle this together. So I hope in some countries, there, is, there are strategic decision makers that are willing to engage with us uh, to really take a national effort in changing. In many countries, that's not the case. Then much better is to identify specific commodities, cassava, maize, rice, to develop models. So that is more restructuring at the crop level. And thirdly, we need to really look what the role of CDIR centers in seed supply is and how, what is their role in pushing varieties, sometimes paying the bill for EGS. So we can see their role more to be a kind of also moving to more systemic than uh, a Band-Aid type of solutions. Then this is really restructuring EGS in countries and across the continent. Again, national level. Sometimes there's opportunities for more regional approaches. Then we, need, we have three types of insights we can see. First one, a lot has been done already by many in many countries. And we are also, all of us are involved somehow in new kind of pilots moving forward. These are not isolated. We should look how, what efforts have been done in maize, in beans, in cassava, uh, uh, soybean. So what can we learn from those and how can they inform those restructuring processes? I mentioned it already. Immature seed markets. There are many examples of public-private partnership in North America, many. But if you go to Brazil, Turkey, or India, there are many examples of entire national systems. We can learn, but we need to learn with African classes on. So, and then that lessons learned are critical to give strategic decision making in countries the, the courage to move against interests of some stakeholders and to make a change. And finally, as EGS is not single, a lot of influences are there in variety release, regulations, uh, others. We need to see how the relations between EGS systems and other uh, factors in the enabling environment are there. These are just some first shots at a very high level that we can move forward. Um, so these are, but going forward, I really want to I, I talk a lot about next steps. It's critical for everybody in the room, but also listening in, to go deeper. What does this mean, what we did over the past time? And I first want to give the floor to Mark Nelson uh, 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 of uh, context to elaborate more in detail the work of the development of the methodology implementation in one of the countries. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I have both the, the privilege and the challenge of sharing the results of a 10-month journey that Context led along with DAI Africa Lead. And I see David tardif Duglins in the room here as well. really do appreciate the opportunity to partner with DAI in this effort. Uh, the journey sought to address a challenge that many farmers in, in Africa unfortunately face. It's, uh, it's a limited supply of, of improved seeds. So to better understand these reasons why, we, we broke down this really big problem into more bite-sized pieces to try to identify ways to overcome some of these hurdles of, of seed access. So first, we, we, we formed an outstanding team of seed experts, country consultant, uh, 
Country Consultant Nationals organized a work plan through the management consulting expertise of, of context in, in DAI. We developed an, an expert-led methodology, a research process to engage key stakeholders of the seed uh, sectors in each of the different countries. We met with farmers and seed multipliers, retailers, managers of seed companies and, and public institutions, as well as government officials and, and NGO program managers. To execute, we teamed up with country consultant nationals, most of whom are on the webinar today. These are consultants that are champions of their respective seed countries, or uh, countries uh, in their seed and sectors. They're deeply insightful, and the approaches that they have brought to this effort to overcome these obstacles are deeply appreciated. So throughout the course of this presentation, I would just encourage you to engage uh, some of these experts uh, on technical questions <laughs> through the webinar's chat feature. We piloted our approach in Rwanda and Zambia. Uh, along with our seed experts, we developed a curriculum to train additional country consultants in Ethiopia this past February. We then replicated this approach in Nigeria and in Kenya. I'll be sharing some select results from the Nigeria study just to provide you with a flavor of the depth of investigation, the analysis that we undertook, and the findings that each of the country studies achieved. Unfortunately, we only have about a handful of minutes here to work with, so I please just encourage you to follow the AgriLinks for the detailed study findings that um, the crop teams have prepared. However, before we jump into the Nigeria study results, I'd like to also mention that towards the end of this work journey, we took a step back and we, we were, did have this opportunity, along with DAI, to synthesize these findings into four, uh, the four country studies. It helped us frame up some of the prevailing themes uh, that came out of the research process and the conclusions that we reached. So I'll highlight some select synthesized findings in the bottom third of this, this presentation to illustrate. We capped off our work journey through producing a guide to assist in-country stakeholders that are seeking to appropriate public sector funds to support EGS in their country's national agricultural and food security investment plans. It provides a framework, it's got resources and tools, and useful advocacy approaches, as well as a sample of investment plan components. Every journey uh, starts with a single step, and then our journey took nine more. Uh, Africa Lead through Monitor Deloitte developed a 10-step methodology for realizing recommendations that address the breakdowns and opportunities of crop-specific supply chains. A close mentor and friend of mine, Dr. Steve Sonk at the University of Illinois, puts it this way, economically sustainable development crop value chains are best realized through a focused improvement on their input technology supply chains. These technology supply chains are like tributaries, feeding into a river of crop commodities. Improving the production of crop commodities requires overcoming these barriers that limit these input technology supply chains that feed it. So first, the country teams define the current situation. What are the country's dominant seed systems, their prioritized crops uh, for value chain development, and what are the current EGS systems within these crops? Next, the economics of the seed systems were analyzed to identify potential EGS demand, cost of production, and to match that demand with the system's revenue and costs. Armed with this research then came the really fun part. How do we shape these findings into thoughtful operational strategies? Subject to the optimal market archetypes. To do this, solutions and recommendations were developed to overcome key challenges, many of which resulted in well-crafted public-private partnership recommendations. So within the Nigeria study, this is how the field team led by Ndidi Nuanali of Sahel Capital made progress through these steps to, to complete this journey. To kick off, the regional stakeholder meetings were held to align on prioritized crops. They organized three of them around the country. To build a list of contacts to interview, and then the team performed over 250 stakeholder interviews. Our team then worked together to synthesize this into the key findings that we, we produced. But then Ndidi then facilitated a stakeholder feedback session of these preliminary findings before we finalized these results through the additional reviews with DAI and USAID. 
From the direction that we reached in the stakeholder workshop in Nigeria, our team then focused on unraveling the current situation of these early generation seed systems for the prioritized crops of yam, maize, rice, and soybean. Along with cassava, maize, and rice, yam is a key food security and smallholder crop in Nigeria. It's a crop that possesses considerable nutritional value and high income generating opportunities for smallholder farmers. However, the crop's production is constrained by an underdeveloped EGS system that limits the yield potential. In Nigeria, maize is a strong and growing demand from the country's feed and food processors. However, the nation's yields are amongst the lowest in the region which in large part is due to a low adoption of maize hybrids. Nigeria is the second largest global importer of rice. Again, insufficient EGS is a major cause of low yields and production quality. The need to address productivity improvement is immense. Almost a six-fold increase in production is needed by 2050. To go from 6 million metric tons of grain demand today to 36 million metric tons, or about a 5% annual rate of growth over the next 35 years. The mothers of Nigeria have a keen sense for this importance, as women today play a major role in the crop's production. Like rice and maize, soybeans is a crop where the government of Nigeria has also made the crop's development a national priority. Growing feed and industrial sectors will require a doubling of production to meet future demand. Fast forwarding through the steps of the journey the crops prior, from the crops prioritized to the team's recommendations, you'll see that the crops selected are quite diverse in the market archetypes that they represent, the specific recommendations that flow out of them. For some of you, this may be the first time that you've been exposed to this four box matrix that contrasts the level of improved demand for improved varieties and the marginal economic value of high quality seed. So for a crop like rice, which we profiled in the upper left-hand quadrant, the demand for rice, high quality rice seed is high and can grow even further as the growing number of rice processors begin to rely on an increased reliable supply of local rice production. There's also a relatively high marginal economic value since the cost of rice seed production is, is low and the seed pricing opportunity is relatively high. These fundamentals support an establishment of a processor-oriented rice seed system to free up the private sector for development legal and policy barriers such as inconsistent import policies as well as a simple and effective quality assurance system needs to be addressed to help stimulate seed demand. Yam on the other hand presents a crop that's characterized in the bottom right hand quadrant with the potential though to shift up. The demand for improved varieties is currently low, but can increase with the development of a formal seed system that combines the production of clean improved seed with farm demonstrations on the benefits of improved varieties. The marginal economic value of yam seed is currently low. However, emerging multiplication technologies developed by IITA hold the potential to significantly reduce seed production costs. So through strong public support, including the establishment of a national yam value chain association, farm demonstrations of improved seeds, the potential exists to scale up seed providers with innovative multiplication techniques. Hybrid maize and soybean are already well situated in the upper right hand quadrant. Both crops have high demand for improved varieties. To address this need for rust resistant varieties in soybean, as well as to develop maize hybrids that are more suitable for the humid rainforest ecology of Nigeria's maize belt. For both crops, marginal economic value of improved varieties is relatively high, driven by a low cost of production and the potential for price premiums of soybean seed, as well as the price premiums that are possible with more productive maize hybrids. So long as the cost of the technical field activities that a company may seed production can be held in check. This assessment holds up, uh, builds up to an EGS PPP that, that focuses on ramping up foundation seed supply, enhancing profitable EGS production capabilities, 
developing cost-effective quality assurance systems, and increasing farmer demand for improved high-quality seed. Across all four crops, Nigeria's seed sector is in need of a national seed fund. To support investments in private company-led ventures, Additionally, quality assurance programs need to be improved through the improvement of or implementation of clear and strong IP policies and the suppression of counterfeit seed through enacting a new seed law. The rationale for public-private partnerships is common across almost all of the early generation seed systems that we profile. A key takeaway from the 12 different crop-specific EGS systems covered in Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, and Zambia. Structural and demand issues that impact the quality, quantity, and use of early generation seed and certified seed can be addressed and resolved. But only if adequate investments in financial and human resources are made. Where possible, seed production operations should be scaled up through complementary multi-crop strategies within a shared geographic and or market focus to help build organizational breadth for these foundation seed operations. In Nigeria, for example, the hybrid maize and soybean PPP has similar end use segments, animal feed, and similar stakeholders across the crop's value chain. Our Zambia field research team recommends that, similar, that similarities between groundnut and common bean justify just one PPP. Both crops are legumes and are very similar in terms of production practices and problems. The crops are both grown in the north and the east regions of Zambia by smallholder farmers in their crop rotations. They also have very similar actors along their crop value chains. Furthermore, combining the two crops creates a scale necessary to generate interest for supplemental private sector investment. Similarly, our Rwanda field research team through assessing several factors justify just one PPP for a potato and for common bean, even though the crop types are, are quite different. Potato is clearly the more attractive crop for the private sector, and for this reason is considered to be the anchor crop of the PPP. Common bean would likely not warrant private sector interest as a standalone crop. So combining, the co combining common bean with potato could create private sector interest without adding undue operational complexity. Our Kenya field research team identified an exception to this multi-crop strategy, recommending instead for separate PPPs that were needed for maize, potato, and for common bean. This is due to country-specific requirements stemming from the geographic differences where the crops are grown and the actors involved in each of the crop's value chains. By now you're hearing a central theme across each of these crop specific studies. That seed system upgrading is possible and the opportunities largely center around the improvement of seed provider profitability. Maize, a significant opportunity exists to increase economic seed value through hybridization. The yield differential realized between hybrids and, and open pollinated varieties creates this. Since hybrid seed also promotes an annualized seed replacement practice, the demand for EGS seed is, is also stabilized. However, technical experience and expertise and hybrid seed production is quite specialized. So EGS operations are best managed through centralized or centrally coordinated production locations by private sector seed providers. Potato, yam, and rice are crops where improvement in marginal economic value also exist through improved varieties that strengthen the quality of production and increase seed prices can be supported. Agronomic traits within improved varieties can address both abiotic and biotic pressures. A key factor to close the supply and demand imbalance is to develop more locally appropriate seed supply chains to balance production costs amid some of the transportation limitations. Common bean and groundnut are crops where economic viability is probably the most greatly challenged. Abiotic pressures and difficulty in transportation limits the economic opportunity to make localized seed production even more critical. In addition to improving the profitability of seed producers, more is needed in policy improvements as well. While we have a number of country-specific policy recommendations in each of the studies, 
I'd like to feature a select set of cross-country policy recommendations, which we categorized into legal and regulatory, resource allocation, and market development. In the dimension of legal and regulatory, there is a need for implementing clear and strong IP policies. Improvements here will enable licensing agreements and support royalty sharing. Just as improvements are needed within contract enforcement mechanisms between seed companies and outgrowers, quality declared systems, frankly, just need to be operationalized. Breeder incentives need to better align with market and impacts. And regarding pr crop production marketing, Establishing grades and standards will enable premiums for improved varieties that deliver on quality traits. Within resource allocation, our team recommends additional public support through increase, an increase in funding for breeding and seed production, as well as national and local extension. More trained quality personnel and storage capacity are also needed. There are numerous market development and market development related policy reforms that will help streamline the functions and improve operational profitability from better information systems to tailored products of credit, input, and packaging that recognize the difference between smallholder farmers and seed entrepreneurs. More training is needed on business, agronomy, and quality practices, as well as stronger marketing communication strategies to promote improved seeds. So the structural and demand issues that we identified through the course of our studies that are limiting the development of these tributaries of seed technology that, that are needed to meet the demands of Africa's crop value chains can be addressed. But this will only be accomplished through some focused attention on policy improvements and better and more profitable seed business models. So now I'd like to introduce Latia to share additional study results and to feature some of the Tanzania findings. Thank you, Mark. Um, um, thank you, Mark, for the transition. Um, to continue the discussion on EGS, oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. To continue the discussion on EGS, I would be concentrating on the synthesis of EGS um, studies conducted by conducted in four of the other countries Ghana, Malawi, Mozambique and Tanzania. These studies were supported by the USAID funded scaling seeds and technologies partnership. These studies were conducted by, um, uh, were supported by the USID funded Scaling Seeds and Technologies Partnership implemented by AGRA. And we conducted these studies in four, four of these countries uh, from April to November 2016. Uh, we followed the data uh, analysis, uh, data collection, and the methodology provided by the Context Network. All of our uh, in-country consultants were trained by the Context Network or trained in the Context Network methodology during the Addis Ababa meetings in February. So first, I'll discuss about the Tanzania case uh, briefly and summarize the proposed action plans for all the SSTP countries um, regarding the EGS implementation. So we, uh, we basically followed these four simple steps, started with an initial stakeholder consultation for the selection of the crops. Uh, the stakeholder consultation involved representation from private firms, public sector, including universities, national systems, and international research centers, and uh, also the key government agencies. And um, we also utilize this opportunity to uh, um, uh, consult with the stakeholders in selecting key crops uh, for each of these countries. The methodology that we followed in Tanzania holds good for all the other four countries also. So, so during the consultation uh, workshop or the initial consultation <coughs> workshop in Tanzania, uh, the, the stakeholders um, selected these four crops across three crop types, namely maize, sorghum, common beans, and cassava. The key priority of the stakeholders in selecting all these crops, food security, 
And as you see that after Nigeria, Tanzania has the highest acreage under maize, more than 4 million hectares of maize uh, are being cultivated, but you know, very low yields and also the poor um, modern varieties adoption exists still. And sorghum, uh, sorghum was another key crop selected by the stakeholders um, because of the resilience nature of the crop, as well as the food security opportunities exist in dry land areas and growing market demand, especially in terms of breweries, the industrial demand. Cassava is another crop, which is a government priority crop in terms of the resilience in dry land areas and high potential for uh, processing. And there is an unmet, unmet EGS demand, especially for disease-free cuttings in Tanzania. So the, followed by the initial selection of the crops, um, we mapped out the seed value chain or the seed, chain, uh, seed production chain for each crop uh, selected. As you could easily see that uh, in except maize, in all the other crops, private, uh, you know, public sector dominates, um, especially the uh, early seed generation seed production system. To an extent in cassava, private sector labs are involved, but not at the seed production stage, but it's more in terms of virus indexing and cleaning the material. So the dominance of private uh, public sector is very, uh, is very apparent in, in the current seed systems. Based on the information collected uh, in the, uh, from the different actors in this existing seed system, especially on the demand aspects of each and every crop, and also the cost of production involved in the uh, different stages of the seed production, we could do a, a detailed economic analysis uh, based on the demand and also the supply uh, side of the uh, um, su supply uh, components of each crop. And also, we, um, uh, based on certain uh, policy uh, implications uh, arise from these crops, we could categorize, we could further categorize each crop um, into uh, an optimal market type. As you could clearly see that, I, I didn't want to, I don't want to explain more on the economic methodology. We follow the economic methodology as explained by Mark in his previous presentation. So we categorize, you could see that most of the crops are, uh, are categorized or um, the most, uh, most of the crops could be categorized under the public-private partnership arrangement where the marginal economic value of, the, uh, of using improved varieties is quite high uh, through these partnerships. But in order to operationalize this operational uh, optimal market type, there are certain challenges that exist in the Tanzanian system or any national system per se. It, it ranges from regulations to technical and management capa capabilities of the system and also the incentives available to take up the EGS seed production or the EGS production systems. For example, in the case of Tanzania, um, licensing of public varieties is there. Since 2011, the government of Tanzania allows uh, licensing of public varieties for private sector. But the, the, the cumbersome procedures involved in it and a lot of excessive delays. So, so far you could see that only four out of 27 companies uh, have taken up this kind of option. In terms of uh, demand creation and market linkages, uh, the, the may, you know, the, the, there is a poor estimation of demand and there is no uh, estimation on how much of a market information available for how much of seeds is needed to cover the area or how much is the adoption or any of those uh, information. The V government breeding programs for crops like beans, cassava, and sorghum also exist, and most of the varieties um, are either coming from this um, uh, international agriculture research centers through national systems, the varieties, except for maize, the varieties released by the national agriculture systems um, are less than 20 per each of these crops. So um, after prepare, a preparation of the EGS report, we, took, uh, we again went back to the stakeholders to, get their, to have their validation. So the validation workshop also was attended by the same stakeholders who participated um, during the initial workshop or the inception workshop in selection of the crops. 
and also in extensive consultations to provide information on various EGS uh, related mechanisms. So we presented the plants, uh, plants um, to the uh, workshop participants uh, during September 29th in the case of Tanzania and in other, other countries also all these validation workshops have been carried out um, uh, during the months of September and October. In, in the case of Tanzania, there was a consensus on the type of the market type, uh, market selected for improving the EGS systems in the case of bees, cassava, and sorghum. There was a slight uh, uh, modification. The stakeholders came up with an idea that why don't you modify the existing, uh, like uh, why don't you modify the market type, optimal market type for sorghum, why don't you categorize under niche because of the demand from the, the specific demand for white sorghum from the breweries? And also, they uh, suggested to include uh, sesame, which is another uh, important crop, export crop, um, especially from the processing sector. There is a huge demand arising. So the Tanzanian group um, agreed um, that they, they will function. Um, through a seed working group, an EGS seed working group, equivalent to the seed platform as explained by um, Walter. And this seed working group will have representation from public and private sector, and it will be supported by the SSTP. So the seed working group will be organized by the seed unit division of Ministry of Agriculture in Tanzania. They will closely work with TASTA, the Tanzania Association of Sea Traders Association, Association members in preparing the financial plans and take it to the next level. So there is a consensus among the Tanzanian stakeholders uh, taking the, uh, taking the uh, action to the next level. Just to give you a quick idea of, uh, there is a clear uh, consensus among um, uh, uh, stakeholders in Tanzania uh, is basically you know where they can involve the private sector in this EGS process, and there was a there was a clear uh, uh, picture emerged on this. If you see the across the uh, uh, different crops and then also the market types selected or the recommended for the SSTP countries, public-private partnership is the dominant uh, partnership or the collaborative mechanism for promotion of EGS systems. In, especially in legumes and roots and tuber crops. So I, I just wanted to end that these are the concrete uh, proposed actions that are being planned to take the EGS uh, implementation to the next level in uh, the SSTP countries. SSTP, the S Scaling Seeds and Technology Partnership of AGRA, will select some key pilot EGS pilot projects in, some, in four of these countries where there is an unmet demand for EGS, and they develop thoroughly vetted business plans for selected crops, and implement these plans through an existing service provider or, or uh, select through a competitive uh, process. These uh, service providers will be also given financial and technical support to ensure the quality. In, in addition to that, SSTP also plans to host a web-based seed platform, especially in, um, in the, uh, towards the exchange of market information uh, on EGS systems. And these, these pilot case studies will act like um, a good learning uh, mechanisms. Successes and failures from these studies would um, help us for adaptability and further scale up in other countries. And that's the idea behind this. I just wanted to thank all our national coordinators of SSTP in all these four countries, and then the research support offered from the Rutgers University Consortium. And also would like to thank our BFS colleagues, Mark and David, for their support. Thank you. Now I give the floor. Now we're going to have some wrap-up remarks given to us by uh, Rob Bertram, the chief scientist of the Bureau for Food Security. Uh, Rob's been uh, engaged with us in a lot of this process and, and has uh, kept, I think, pretty close tabs on the work we're doing. So look forward to hearing what his observations are. Thanks, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, 
I heard from Dave and Mark yesterday that we had over 300 people signed up for the webinar, which I think is an indication of how important the topic is this morning. And I want to start with a few thanks. I was lucky enough to be at the launch in Addis, when was that, a year and a half ago or so, Walter? Somewhere there. Um, and uh, I want to especially thank uh, Walter. Uh, this is one of, I think, our most exciting partnerships of, with the Gates Foundation, and there are many of them. And uh, he's just had the, the vision from day one and been the real driver here, so congratulations. By the way, I, I have the report. I just got it. I've just flipped through it. It looks fantastic, so I really commend it all to you. It's, it's worth looking at. There's a lot of easy-to-understand graphs and pictorial representations, some of which Mark used in his talk and a lot of used. So please do um, take a deeper dive when your time permits. Um, and uh, thanks also to Mark and to Context, a terrific partner to us in this endeavor, and to Lata, and I, I'm excited, Lata, to have IFTC still engaged, and I'll say a little bit more about that, so both for your work but also for your institution. Um, so I'd like to step, step back for a minute and make a few comments on why this is an important topic. Uh, Walter, I think you touched on some of these, and uh, but in, in doing this, I also want to speak with a certain humility because there's a lot of people both in the room and also I'm sure on our uh, in our web webinar audience who you know have far more engagement in this than I. Um, but I think uh, seeds are such a crucial piece of overall agricultural productivity and resilience, both both factors. And uh, they, they, they're a beautiful technology in as much as they're scale neutral in most cases. Now, not always the, the marketing issues around them and the decision making issues that drive the investment in them is not necessarily scale neutral. But the beauty is that it's scale neutral and it's easy to use. Most farmers know how to you know, plant seeds. So there's a lot of beauty there uh, that make it especially attractive. Of course, uh, what we also have is a huge investment, both by the foundation, uh, in the CGIR system, in our Feed the Future Innovation Labs, in genetic improvement, much of which hinges in terms of achieving any of its promise on the effective operation of seed systems. So that's why I think this is, you know, it, if you look at how much is being invested globally in genetic improvement, and folks, we're at a time when our tools for crop improvement are better than ever before, we can make progress at two and three times the, the, the rate that we used to be able to do using techniques like genomic selection. But if we don't solve this seed bottleneck, it's not going to make a difference. It's, it'll be beautiful in Europe and the United States and parts of Asia, but we've got to make sure that it's beautiful in sub-Saharan Africa too. And another point that I like to make that I want to say here is, to me, this is the most important pillar of climate smart agriculture in Africa. If we know anything about climate change, it is that pests and diseases faced by farmers, including smallholder farmers, are going to be changing more rapidly than ever before. Not to mention abiotic stresses like heat and drought and storm, uh, uh, flood, uh, all of the, the changes that we associate with climate change. There's also a whole set of pest and disease changes that will accompany it. So with, again, being able to both develop but then deploy in a nimble way new genetic solutions to help combat these problems, one piece of it only, of course, there's a lot of others, is, is critical. Um, now, I think a couple of other points to make is that although farmers know how to plant seeds and, and seeds are scale neutral and so forth, seed production is very different from crop production. And I think that came through this morning. Um, the, we, there are diverse needs. It's not all one size fits all. We heard that come through clearly when we think of hybrids in, in, in maize, but also vegetables. I mean, and of course, that bears looking at that, that high value vegetable, mostly imported seed system in Africa, which may actually work in some cases. But, and I'm going to be, you know, a little, I'll say more on this, but I think part of the reason it works is that it's not, nobody interferes with it. It's, it doesn't have a, a, a strong regulatory overlay, frankly. Um, 
So people can buy F1 tomato seeds or F1 cucumber seeds that are produced in Thailand and Taiwan and, and, and exploit that value proposition in their, in their production. Um, then we have our, 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 our row crops, our vegetatively propagated, propagated crops. I appreciate the fact that oil seeds were mentioned in, in particular. Uh, we invest in the Feed the Future Innovation Lab on soy improvement uh, and soy value chains. Uh, and, and seed is an absolute critical obstacle to overcome if, if smallholders are going to be part of the soy revolution that's coming to Africa. And that revolution is coming. Whether we do anything in AID or not, it's coming. The question is what will it look like and how will smallholders be able to be participating in those high value value chains around imp quality foods, around feeds, around oil. Uh, and, and the whole value link to poultry, swine, and other uh, product, fish, uh, also production. Um, and uh, let's see, I have a note here saying consumers vary. Ah, yeah, I meant to say that just in terms of the risk profile, which I referred to earlier. That's one of the main challenges we have when we're thinking about uh, uh, smallholders, uh, poverty, and nutrition enhancement focus. A lot of the people we're trying to help naturally and logically have a, a strong risk aversion. So seed is one more expense where we want to try to change that, the, 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 the level of that playing field so that um, they are better able to, to take that risk and benefit from that investment. Um, so we, you know, one of the things that underlies our work here is in Africa especially is that we have this both this informal and formal system, this continuum between the two. Um, I think today was mostly about trying to uh, grow the formal system, although I think there's a lot of opportunities in what our speakers talked about for leakage into the informal system, and that might be something that could be very usefully thought about, and I invite people like Louise Sperling and others to think about, you know, how do we get the genetic improvements into those systems. I know she has thought about that. Maybe we'll hear from her in the discussion. Um, uh, foundation seed, uh, well, no, before I leave the formal and formal, I want to say that um, while we have those two systems to deal with now, my feeling is that the formal seed sector is the future, 20, 30 years from now. I think the informal system will still exist, but it will exist the way it exists in other parts of the world. But most farmers will be purchasing quality seed, or, or at least, uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of, of even if they're not getting um, commercial seed in a, in a, from a private company, at least getting quality seed from some sort of uh, uh, initiative that we have many examples of that were referred to, where you really have sort of a public-private partnership. In, in, in how seed reaches farmers. So um, I'm supposed, oh, we don't have that slide up, Mark. I was, was somebody going to put that up? But b I, before that slide goes up, and I have to say, I feel a little bit um, in, uh, intimidated trying to talk about the lessons learned because this is really their lessons learned. But, uh, but I do want to kind of uh, try to be um, a little bit um, provocative when I'm looking forward. We, we're turning a corner in Africa, I think. Malabo is a, is a great thing to have the, the, this commitment from Africa's leaders. I always say it's not going to happen without changes in the fertilizer system. I don't think it's going to happen without changes in the seed system either. So if we're going to double productivity in agriculture by 2025, these are two critical uh, inputs. Um, just thinking about some of the points that were made this morning, well, we did. We saw that original analysis from Detroit. Maize looked like it could run on its own uh, in terms of the private sector, and yet, um, Mark, you also indicated a role, at least in, I think in Nigeria, that where the public sector might have a role. So I was curious about that, um, is because I, I I'm wondering, you know, what happens if we just step back and let the private sector do it? Will can that happen if if we free them up to do it? And maybe maybe hybrid maize is the place to experiment with that. Um, the National Seed Fund idea, um, maybe, I don't know, I, I, I have to say a lot of times what I ended up thinking about this morning is how do we get government out of the
business, even though I know we were talking about public investment. So I don't know if that seed fund, maybe that's one way to do it. Uh, I was worried about the calls for enforcement. It scares me, frankly, because I think the, the unintended consequences of trying to have an overlay, and I would be much more excited at the concept of building brand and brand identity and providing, uh, providing systems through the private sector that farmers trust. And I, that can happen. It happens in other parts of the world. It can happen in Africa. Um, EG, let's see. Uh, it, very interesting about the CGIAR taking on a systemic role. That's, I think that begs a lot of other questions as to what the CGIAR itself looks like in terms of specialization, because those are very different roles, you know, the, between. Um, moving through a development chain into the seed system and doing the actual breeding and but but the knowledge there is a lot of knowledge connections and other connections between them so that's and I, I represent the US in the CGIR so I was quite interested and be interesting to hear more about that so I ho hope you provoke a lot of thinking and making that uh, a re recommendation and then the operationalizing quality declared seed I really like that uh, again it kind of takes lessens the government role maybe I don't know that maybe I'd be interesting to hear what people who work on the informal systems think about that but even in the formal setting and it, and in terms of these various policy constraints that seemed all the speakers uh, alluded to we have a great opportunity with Akin Adesina at the head of the African Development Bank you know when he was in Nigeria as minister he tried to move certification into the private sector. I don't know how that work has worked out, frankly. I mean, it, but it was a very, very well-intentioned and, and uh, attempt to, to try to free up the private sector in Africa. So I wonder if there isn't an opportunity with him at the helm and with you know Gates and USAID and, and all the other partners, DFID, the Syngenta Foundation that have, have labored in this space, the Dutch, um, if we couldn't, have some sort of high-level dialogue with him to really figure out, and maybe even if it's get some countries that are willing to lead. I love the fact that they took a country-led approach on this, that, and I love the fact that you all have developed a set of consultants. These are the people on the ground who are going to be really critical advocates going forward. But I think we have to kind of marry that bottom-up approach, maybe with some high-level leadership. So I'd love to see that happen, and I think. Akina Adesina might be somebody who could play a, a really pivotal role in that. So these are these lessons learned, and and I I think it's probably just as well you you read them. Um, they, I think I don't need to to read them for you. I hope you can see them in the back of the room. Uh, but I do uh, uh, I do want to I really want to give a shout out to the whole idea of quality seed. It's not just genetics. Genetics is a big part of it, but it's the actual quality seed, the germination, the reliability, the disease-free, um, also the needs for the different uh, 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 types of crops. I was really glad to hear the examples on vegetatively propagated uh, crops. The value of clean seed alone, without the genetics even, is huge. But those are really challenging uh, systems. And the 3G potato work that's gone on in East Africa, I think, is a good example of of how this can work with minimal government involvement. It's really a private sector-led effort because you, you need that capacity in terms of getting the clean material, and then you get a you need a, a system to multiply it closer to the to the to the uh, customers. Um, and let's see that tailored, tailored training programs. Um, Anyway, I, I think I, I won't try to, to read all through this. Some of these things aren't new. I looked at number five. Um, that's I, I you know I believe that's it's good to be reminded. I'm not that's not a criticism that they're not new. We need to keep these in view. Um, but but let's figure out how to underscore the urgency of this. The science tells us it's urgent. The 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 climate and the the, the challenges farmers face tell us it's urgent. Uh, and 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 the the fact that you know millions of children are still stunted, and and and, and many die from uh, causes linked to undernutrition tell us it's urgent. Uh, this is a huge contribution. I want to thank everybody involved. I want to also again thank Mark and David. It's such an 
honor and pleasure to work with committed visionary colleagues like them here in the Bureau for Food Security. So I hope there's, well, I didn't take too much time, but uh, over to uh, you, Mark, I think. No, Julie, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, Mark, uh, Latya, Mark, and Walter, um, for excellent presentations and reflections. We have uh, about 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. I know that's not a lot of time, but we're hoping to keep the conversation going on AgriLinks. We have a, an open kind of discussion available on AgriLinks right now um, that we'll email to all of you and to those online. Um, so, oops, sorry, thank you. So... Uh, we'll take questions from both our online audience and in the room, and I just ask that you, um, uh, if you won't mind, speak your name and your organization and keep things fairly concise so that we can get through as many questions as possible. I'll get you in just a moment, but first I wanted to just let you know that we have 133 participants online, which is fantastic. And uh, the online audience was mulling over kind of a, a really fundamental question, what are the bounds of early generation seed? What is that? How are you defining EGS? So just thought I'd get that out of the way to make uh, It brings in the breeder seat, basically where far breeders or are maintaining genetic uh, starting material for all the seed production. And then there's basically a pre-basic basic or foundation seed. Uh, uh, and of course, depending on the crop, that is if it's cassava, a maize with inbred lines, uh, beans, these, all these structures are very different, but it's all the er early stages before the production of quality seed, whether that's certified or any other. Great, thank you. And for our online participants, I'll let you know, we don't have an in-room mic to pass around today, but I'll very quickly summarize the questions that come in in the room. So, yes. Great, thank you. So putting ourselves in the shoes of a private sector investor, what are the immediate opportunities to incentivize key actors and can we realistically attract private investors in Africa? Yeah, so Mark Nelson with Context. And one of the aspects of the work that we really wanted to dig into was how to help prepare investors for what a business case in an early generation seed business model would need to look like. So. One of the things that we hope to accomplish through this work was to be able to best uh, lay out what are all those elements that would go into making that kind of investment decision. Um, as you think about some of the things that could provide some impetus uh, to push investors forward, one of the things that I think we need to really be mindful of, and, and Rob, I'm going to pull back to one of the comments that you raised earlier, and it was you know, the question of this National Seed Fund. So. So there's two different types of investors, right? There's, there's, there's investors that basically have capital and they're looking on how to best deploy it. And then there's the business entrepreneurs that are investing their own time and resources in, and how do they have access to the capital to help mobilize some of their ideas. And there's a little bit of everything going on, um, but one of the things that is really critical in early generation seeds is to recognize that the payback on investment has a pretty long time horizon. And, and that creates um, some pretty good risk or pretty significant risk for a, for a private sector actor. So places where we saw most immediate impetus uh, for opportunities were areas where you had crop value chains where um, off takers were quite interested in seeing that productivity gap being addressed. So there were areas where we had processors, such as the rice processors example, or similarly, we've done some work in cassava in Nigeria as well, where a processor has an interest in actually pulling through some of these early generation seed activities. And so that, that, that's helpful because then you actually can build a business case. You can work towards uh, solving for some of their private sector interests and then, and then demonstrate that this is actually something that can be scaled outside of that. So once you can start proving the technology, proving the seed technology, through an actor that actually can, can see those benefits being materialized. On the other end of that equation, if, if you're really trying to help entrepreneurs that are trying to mobilize ideas, uh, there is a real capital constraint. This is a very real situation. 
and especially in some of the food security crops where you're not linked up to an off taker where we're actually working with smallholder farmers that are trying to figure out how to better utilize genetics or, or, or varieties that can improve their household livelihoods the ability to sort of help small and medium-sized entrepreneurs um, probably the number one effort there is to really help them with business training as well as to help them with access to capital because th there is a pretty considerable investment that requires in many cases uh, at least one or two years before the the fruits of that labor can be returned okay. Okay. Um, I'll take a one more question from our online audience uh, Stephanie White asked during Walter's presentation when you say economic analysis what types of economic analysis are you speaking of what are the metrics of success and is this effort guided by what's going on in global markets or more so local and regional markets? It's basically for every step what's calculated in the methodology, breeder seed, and all the other classes, what is the profitability, and then link that also through the seed value chain uh, uh, to the sales of uh, uh, quality seed, uh, uh, certified seed. So every step is basically the, the economic analysis of the different steps. And maybe a little bit more detail Mark can give. Yeah, much of the economic analysis that we've focused on here was not at a macro level. This is more thinking in terms of an individual actor or private sector company. So we're thinking about a business model. We're thinking about what is what is it going to take to have this operations uh, become something that can be viable, economically sustained long term. And so I'd say the, the fundamental um, methodology or technique that we, we worked with all the crop consultants to country consultants to work through was really an activity-based costing approach where we were breaking up what are all those specific activities that you that are required in order to effectively start with breeders material and have a sufficient supply or quantity of the early generation seed available for the next step and there are many different functions uh, you know we have the benefit of having some pretty strong uh, seed uh, experts on our teams that understand what are all those elements that go into producing um, producing seed and really helping build out what are the economics underlying that. So getting down to the level of thinking about some really important key metrics on how do you start from uh, quantities of material and go through a multiplication step? Because the, the biggest challenge in um, the crux of the business case is how can we most successfully start with a limited amount of material and, and, and achieve a multiplication step that's highly cost effective? And so another impetus for that was uh, you know mentioned of, of private sector opportunities, there's, there's been a focus in certain crops where that have been neglected um, in terms of what are ways of different seed technologies, seed multiplication technologies that can be more cost effective. And, in, in cases of tuber crops, for example, there there's some advancements being made on uh, how do we go through that uh, propagated crop multiplication step? Because if you're just doing a factor of five, you know, or ten, it takes a lot of area, it takes a lot of manpower, it takes a lot of variable cost to get to that next level of of scaled up seed. And so a lot of the the technique that we went through were to basically start at that level of understanding quantities that are required or, or, or materials are required whether it's land labor time personnel and and how much additional material were we able to produce through that level of investment to basically understand what is the profitability equation and, and in many cases it's very difficult and, and because you're, you're then needing to get to a place to where you realize producing seed is more expensive than producing commodity and, and in crops that are open pollinated, a, a farmer is thinking about, do I pay you know, 50 cents a kilo versus for this grain that I had last year, which doesn't have the same quality parameters or, or, or level of performance even in some cases, to a clean or, or variety that has better improved genetics to it. That may cost you know, anywhere from one, one or two, in some cases in the open pollinated varieties, two or three X that, that cost of just the commodity grain. And, so how do you help a farmer think through what the benefit of that is? And one way to basically justify that there is additional cost is to also then have simultaneously demonstrations that go along with it. So some of the, the economics we got into were then to reach forward beyond to help basically explain what the market environment would be looking like because we wanted to make sure there was attention to demand. Um, another huge unknown and any risk in this is 
is what the projected demand is. So we needed to have a better understanding of what is the value proposition likely to look like for the farmer so that they could then essentially free up the capital or make the investments in this higher cost of seed production. Great. Thank you. A question from... <laughs> That's all right. um, uh, so recognizing that these problems are not new, what will make this time different? There's an importance in um, uh, catalytic organizations helping build those. But I think the, the crux of the question is how, what is the role of indicators? How are we measuring our progress and showing how this time can be progress over previous efforts? Okay, thank you. It's a uh... Of course, I think everybody working in the seed sector is continuously in these deja vus, but we are also in this analysis paralysis situation. And I think we took the courage to focus on one, and basically Mark and David, and then we were able to convince our colleagues, let's just focus on one, and took an economic perspective, which in a public sector dominated seed sector in Africa is not so easy, uh, because we are basically dealing with research stations and research directors who do seed production as a side activity. Of course, there's economics in that, but they are not really aware, basically also referring to that. So, so I think what is different is, and in that way, I really want to recognize the work of the agency with its national missions and also as a seed program in a number of countries to really work through a seed platform, bring local consultants, try to identify, I think uh, Agra through SSP has identified really catalytic, young, strategic players who move around in a political economy of seed, because there's also a political economy, and they move around to that. And I think Richard Jones has been leading that with his colleagues in the four countries, five countries very well. So by that setting up, maybe it's not deja vu, that is not only a discussion in Seattle, or Washington DC, or Nairobi, or Accra, or uh, and, uh, and in, in, uh, and in uh, Abidjan, but it's also especially a discussion in Lilongwe, in Dar es Salaam, Arusha, others. And I think that is, that is what is making a difference. I am hopeful for this kind of national restructuring of the EGS system, but that you're talking about basically the seed sector, in a number of those countries where there are key players in those countries who have the courage to move forward, knowing that it's different, uh, that isn't required. But if they take agricultural transformation, like the bank, Agra, the foundation, we take very serious. And if we take resilience, we add that to it also. Uh, at national level, there are key decisions to make us to really start to move around and change the seed sector and certain functions required by a public sector, because some functions this study also show are not profitable and never going to be profitable. So others are. So when they are profitable, public sector have to move out. And that is, in that way, if that, can, that kind of change can take place in a number of countries or within arrangement about beans or cowpea, when it's more crop tight, if we develop those new models, I think we can make a change. Um, I, I think we'll take one more in-person question. Uh, but also, before you take off, we just request that you fill out the surveys that are on the center of your table, if you, if you will, to help us plan our uh, next year of AgriLinks events. Chrissy. Julie, I want to come, because that also your point on indicators comes here. Because basically, if we really, I de the strategic decision makers at national level need evidence to convince their key de others in their system, the private sector needs to show this technology is there, but there is a system problem. The, basically, the quality assurance system hampers development of the sector, or uh, that's a... Uh, uh, not doesn't progress or, or other ways. They need the kind of indicators. And of course, the leaders in the Malabo Declaration, there are indicators, but they are very high level. Eh? Seed is one of the indicators embedded in, embedded in inputs. I think if countries really have a good sense 
and we at the Gates Foundation and Agra others are involved in developing sets of indicators that really inform decision makers. So if we do that right, we give them the evidence for sometimes taking tough decisions. Uh, well, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time since we're slated to wrap up at 11, but we highly encourage you to stick around, network, get some more food and juice, um, ask questions of our presenters if you're here in person. And for those online, please, please continue the conversation uh, in the chat box and on AgriLinks. So thank you so much to our presenters, but mostly thank you to you for joining us, and we'll see you uh, at AgriLinks events next year. Thank you. Talking too much. <laughs> it's always